You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Shalomi, I want to welcome you to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, I'm very excited about this episode. I know you've worked with Sean Randolph on a publication for the Bay Area Council. We've had Sean on the show in the past. And, well, I really, I already know our community is going to love this episode and all the knowledge and, and wisdom they're going to gain from it. But you know, before we even start, and Shalomi, what, what does a day look like as the Consulate General here in Silicon Valley? Sean, thank you so much. And it's great to be on your show. I'm uh, really excited to, you know, for this, uh, to have this conversation look in, and to share, I would say, Israel's story and Israel in the Bay Area story. Um, but as a consul general, first of all, I'll start with saying that we cover, we're part of eight consulates across the United States. And we cover a very vast territory that goes all the way from Silicon Valley to Alaska. Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. So a day in the, in the constant generous life, you look very vibrant, very diverse, um, very active between you know, being in touch with our peers and our friends in different, in different states, in different industries, in different communities, and to maintain and strengthen the relationship that we, Israel, has with American friends. Um, in different circles. That's why we're here. And that's, uh, that's why, you know, we are so busy on a daily basis, on, on, on every hour, on an hourly basis. I had no idea the territory you covered. I mean, all the way to Alaska, that's, yeah. that's quite a, quite a landmass. That... Yeah. Alaska is 75 times larger than Israel, and California is 19 times larger than Israel. So you can, you can imagine for us, coming from a small country, it's definitely vast territory. Speaking of Israel, I mean, the Jewish community, very strong here in Silicon Valley. But most people here, I would say, have never actually visited there. They've heard a lot about it. And one thing that's in the news more and more is Wadi, the Silicon Valley of Israel. Can you tell us more about, about that for our, for our listeners that may have heard a little bit, but really you know, never visited, never, you know, just so they can grasp it. Yeah. Well, thank you. A wadi actually is an Arabic word for a valley. And uh, we used it as, as um, I would say, um, as a title for the report, just to, to make, to show the similarities that exist between, um, between Silicon Valley and, and, and Israel, or the Israeli Silicon Valley, which stretches mostly along the, the coastal area, but also in other places. Um, but we're talking about a country of 9 million people that has the largest, I would say, concentration of foreign companies that are investing and uh, opening R&D centers in Israel, definitely in the Middle East, but probably uh, compared to uh, many other countries. Um, 400 multinationals that opened, started with Microsoft and Intel and many others who are present in Israel, who are employing a lot of Israeli um, you know, software engineers and engineers general, and who are making this, who are contributing and making this ecosystem very vibrant and very significant to Silicon Valley because of the innovation that is being developed in Israel. Um, so, you know, if you can, if you talk about Intel inside, it's actually in many cases is Israel inside uh, because a lot of next stage Intel chips or next Intel or Microsoft uh, software is being developed in Israel. The Israeli ecosystem started actually more, well, in the early days of Israel, it started um, with the focus on agriculture and to try and find agricultural solutions to or in, in, in solutions to water scarcity. So a lot of development started and the mindset of innovation started there. And then later on in the 80s, in the 70s, um, the, some semiconductors started, companies started to, um, to open and, and uh, again, um, more of because of technological necessity for the military and for, for our own solution. In the 80s, there was a huge trend of, started a huge trend of going into <clears throat> high schools that are um, more technologically oriented. And then 
of course, kids who in the military started to be more and more technological. And that created the whole ecosystem that started in the 90s um, of, you know, the startup, the startup kind of mentality, building more and more company, building more innovation of our own. Add to this another component, which was a massive migration from former Soviet Union uh, countries that over a million people that moved to Israel between 89 to 90, to, 19, to 2000. With, who came and a million people who are very educated to move to Israel um, and were another factor in what is called in the technological innovation boom that took place in Israel. A lot of stuff there. So a million people moved over from former Soviet Union to Israel. What, what was the change in the population then? It must have increased by about 20% in a short amount of time. In 10 years, Israel absorbed close to about, about 20% of, its, uh, of the population that we had back in 89, 90. How did that change the culture right then? Oh, significantly. It had, it had a huge contribution on, um, on, first of all, bringing, you know, having, having so, many, so many immigrants coming to Israel basically created... Um, not only, as I said earlier, people who came and, and made and helped with academic and, and professional knowledge, but also cultural change. Um, today in Israel, you have newspapers in Russian language. Uh, you have radio stations in Russian language. And, and having one million people coming from the former Soviet Union where Russian was the main, the dominant language, that definitely created kind of a new spirit in, in the change in the country. By the way, I myself moved to Israel when I was seven, in, in, when I was nine from the Soviet Union. Really? Yeah. How many languages can you speak? Uh, three plus. <laughs> Impressed. And for our listeners, um, Salami is very fluent in Mandarin. So anytime you see him on the street, just ask him, uh, you know, <clears throat> say a few words. Yeah, well, very fluid is uh, you know is a, is, a, is a very generous definition. <laughs> Going back to the this great migration to Israel and the culture around the startup ecosystem there, we've had Jeff Wolf on the show in the past that talked about he was in the military. I guess everyone has to serve in the military there for a number of years and. And that almost was like a, an accelerator incubator for him for later on starting his companies. Can you talk about how maybe there's, you know, through, through military that there's this guidance, this training to help people if they want to go the entrepreneur route? Or actually, before even that, is it part of the culture, would you say, to take risks to be that entrepreneur mindset or is it not? So it is part of the culture because I would say our necessity in our geostrategic um, challenges and, um, and realities are put, put us in the past, not only in the 90s, and, 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 um, but from day one in the position that we need to take risk. Um, whether it's by defending ourselves, by creating, by, um, by trying to be ahead. And this is how we define sometimes the Israeli chutzpah, which is the Israeli kind of daring, taking the chance, taking the risk, being, um, I would say, more energetic and dynamic. Sometimes it can sound rude, but sometimes it can be. Um, but that's what makes the innovation and the the step of let's let's take a risk. Let's try. Let's let's move. Let's move the needle. Let's get out of the box. Um, and getting out of the box, you know, is maybe another definition to a chutzpah because then this is when you push the envelope and you kind of trying to get to the next um, to the next technological, um, let's say, a frontier. Um, but talking about the military um, again and. You know, it seems like the the innovation in many cases, this in our case, is 
it derives from the necessities and need to find solutions and the need to defend ourselves and the need to preserve technological edge. Um, and that was, in a way, especially in the military, this is, it's very necessary to preserve your ability to, you know, to, be, to be ahead of others, to take, let's say, to put the onus on others and to be ahead of others when you need to defend yourself. So when you are in this position and in this kind of a mindset, you innovate. You need to think differently. You need to think out of the box and to create. And that kind of creates a whole culture that those who are leaving the military after three years, whether in technology or in other fields, those are, those are the creators of the next, the next startups, let's say a series of startups. For example, there is a company that I know that is um, looking to move into the Bay Area, and it's called the Squadron. And the Squadron takes a lot of, for example, what has been developed in the Air Force in terms of, you know, how do you think, how do you train, how do you bring people to, how do you train people for um, unexpected situations? How do you do a team building? So they bring kind of a lot of culture from the Air Force, they bring it into the industry. So taking a lot of these kind of ideas and bring, taking them to the next step outside of the military to see how this can be applied in the civilian life. Interesting. I mean, I've heard it in a lot of times that the best companies are built during hard times, built during the recessions. And would you say that that could be true when life's comfortable, you don't take the risk, you don't take, you don't push yourself for the challenge by having kind of maybe not the most comfortable life, it encourages entrepreneurism. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you take, um, in, in the case of Israel, it definitely creates, creates entrepreneurism. I mean, it's, it's, it's different when you compare small countries to big countries. Uh, there are definitely you know, difference in the culture and the way of in the mentality. And definitely there is a difference between countries which are under threat to countries which are very comfortable. Um, so you have two mindsets which are completely different. Plus, as I showed with you earlier, Israel is a country of immigrants people who return to Israel from different places. And when it comes to even social innovation, social integration, how, how do you integrate people who move, one million people from former Soviet Union, with people who move from, with Jews who move from Ethiopia, with Jews who move from India, from North America, from Latin America, and many other countries. So even here you have a certain kind of innovation process of integrating cultures and building world society. By the way, the military actually has been kind of a melting pot for, for the Israeli society because kind of the Israeli salad, which is we have like kids from Ethiopia, from Russia, from other places coming together, serving in the military, getting to know each other. They're leaving the men, they're leaving the military, they're becoming friends for life. Um, and they're not foreign to each other. So that that's something which is very unique in Israel's case. That is interesting because I, I mean I would guess when you're in those situations, the bond between <clears throat> you and the people you're serving, the you know, your life's on the line, is probably I mean, if you can trust them with your life, I think you probably trust them with yeah. your your startup and, and working with you. And you don't, and, and when you have, let's say, a kid whose parents moved from Ethiopia and grew up from, in Israel, and the kid from the, moved from, you know, take it from Russia, from Ukraine, from Georgia, from other places, um, when they're in the military, cultural differences are not something which matter. It's about what the military needs and how do you provide the solution. 
Um, so then there is more what brings them together than what puts them apart, pushes them apart. And and the creation of, of this common experience, that what builds the society. Speaking of the military and bringing people together and the government, how does the society kind of decide in the direction it's going to take for innovation? Is it based on the entrepreneur with an idea or is there support or encouragement from the government to go in certain directions? I think today where Israel stands, it's basically it's the, it's the industry which, which is mature enough to look for new frontiers and to for, for new ideas and to take it to the, to the next level. For example, the gaming industry, NFTs are very developed in Israel and very like, and you know, Israel is very well, well known for cyber, but the NFTs and, and, and the gaming is also, um, you have a lot of development of this in these industries. But it's not that the government is not there. I think there is a conversation, there is a dialogue taking place today and is, as well as in the past, where the government is, of course, interested to develop you know, or was interested to develop the tech industry. That's how, in the nineties, the startup of the VC, uh, the VC industry, started in Israel. It started with governmental money, which was allocated for VCs, which later on left the government and became independent. Um, and through the years, the VC, the VCs in Israel, in Israel started to develop. On top of it, um, the Office of Chief Scientist, and today, which is called the Innovation Authority, are the ones who are leading and supporting the next, I would say, the next frontier, the next, innova- the ne- the next industry, and the next vertical that will be developed. Um, it's not that they are dictating. There is, you know, there is a conversation between the two. There is a dialogue between the two. There is exchange of ideas between the two. Um, there are. You know, they look at what's happening in the world, where are the next stages. Take, for example, the climate change issue and the challenges in the climate change. Today, there is a growing emphasis on, on what's called desert tech and climate tech and, and mobility, which are part of, part of um, looking at what are the different challenges of where things can develop. Um, the food tech and the food industry is also being um you know, is 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 very significant uh, in in in. And what the government does is basically, it's not telling the startups you have to develop this industry and that industry. It creates, let's say, grants through the Innovation Authority or through other, um, um, let's say, vehicles, and not necessarily looking for stakes, but looking to create the next innovation, the next startups, and the next, um, the next, uh, would say. Um, uh, the next industry. For example, you know, in um, I think I think the the numbers are not necessarily we're not necessarily looking at, at billions of dollars, but looking at, at significant. The numbers are significant enough in order to to push the industry and start a new frontier. That's interesting because. I mean, here in Silicon Valley, venture capitalists are always thinking, is the market big enough to support a unicorn? Mm-hmm. Whereas it kind of sounds like there, even if it's a, as small as it sounds, a couple hundred million, it's worth, if it can help the country or it can help others, it's worth taking that path. It's worth investing the resources. But can we go back to just the kind of the venture capitalist community in Israel? From my understanding, pretty much every major Silicon Valley VC now has an office in Israel. Is is this true? And and how has that kind of played a part in the ecosystem there? So let, let's let's look, let's look at the numbers a little bit. You mentioned we mentioned earlier the Innovation Authority and the the chief scientist. Um, the Innovation Authority in 2020 invested 300, 700 million dollars in our and in the ND forms of loans that are paid off when the products become profitable. So you're not talking about $5 billion, $10 billion, less than $1 billion, and, and it's being paid off when you know, the company becomes profitable, which can last quite a long time, right? 
So that's one. So the government is more into creating the ecosystem rather than, you know, rather than uh, supporting or or uh, pouring money into the industry. So that that's that's one. When we talk about the VCs, fifty four VCs from Silicon Valley have invested in seven hundred fifty Israeli startups. Wow, okay. that's a good number. And we talk about over $22 billion that were invested from Silicon Valley in the past 17, 18 years. Just in 2018, Silicon Valley companies invested close to one, around $1.8 billion in Israeli companies. Huge. You know, I came, <clears throat> I visited um, today Salesforce, which one of its latest acquisitions was about $800 million. So the VCs and the big companies see a lot of, I would say, uh, value in Israeli companies. And that's why, going back to the earlier stage of the conversation, there are about 400, more than 400 multinationals present in Israel. What would you say that these VCs, these big companies in Silicon Valley, what are they finding in Israel that's exciting them so much? Is it the cutting edge technology? Is it the workforce? Is it the the culture to innovate? What are some of the things that they're finding? So the culture to innovate is there almost wherever you go. When you talk about VCs, I think they can find companies at the, at the early stage that can be attractive, that can help bring to California or help them to scale in Israel and then basically grow and become a very significant uh, companies. Look at the number of unicorns. I mean, unicorns, just last year, we're talking about over 20 unicorns from Israel. Um, some of them are present in Silicon Valley and they moved from Israel five, six, seven years ago from Israel to Silicon Valley. Um, but <clears throat> so, so that, that's on, on, on the VC side. On the company side, I think the very high level workforce, software engineers, um, experts in AI, people who are people people who are really coming with a very significant innovative experience that can make a very significant contribution to the company. Take for example Microsoft. Microsoft has been present in Israel for decades. Intel. Intel, probably about 40 years in Israel. Uh, a lot of what you see Intel inside is actually Intel Israel inside. Um, so, so it has to offer what we spoke about earlier, the innovation, innovative thinking, the you know, thinking out of the box. Bringing new solutions, new new kind of anti, new new angles or new approaches, um, and again it goes back to the necessity and to need to build yourself. Um, let's go seventy four years back where we talk about a country that was created in forty eight, started needed to survive a war with six hundred thousand people. Today we are. 9.5 with $50,000, $50,000 GDP per capita, maybe a little bit less now, but about 48, but, and company that has like the highest, you know, unicorns in, in, in dozens, um, and water solutions and, and so many other things, which is really actually made a contribution to the world. I want to talk about the water solutions, but even before that, I mean, we've talked about the size of Israel, the population, the land mass. When a company wants to expand out of Israel, what's normally the the path it takes? So the path is the the pattern that we saw in the past thirty years is raising funds in Israel, like very early stage. Um, it can be pre seed, it can be seed, it's kind of really starting in incubators. Some of the incubators, by the way, are located in the universities, in, in several Israeli universities, famous uh, like the Technion, the Hebrew University, etc. 
But then once the company is starting to scale in terms of it needs more resources, in many, many cases, the VCs are expecting them to move to Silicon Valley and to start working from here because from here they can you know, have a closer contact, physical contact, plus they can help to scale and to have them exposed to, to the industry here in Silicon Valley, which is not only a Silicon Valley industry, but actually a global industry. Um, so that creates a very strong linkage and bond between Silicon Valley in Israel and Silicon Valley here, which is, you know, which is industry driven and comes bottom up and creates this kind of, you know, exchange. You have, you know, before the pandemic, the, the flights were packed. The flights to Israel, Tel Aviv, and, and, and you know, and SFO were like packed because people were flying all the way back and forth. So that definitely, it definitely, um, what, what makes it so unique. For companies that when they come here and land, what types of resources are available for, to help? I mean, does, can the consulate help them at all in their expansion? So I think the first step is, um, for companies that are coming in cases of you know, having VCs from California, they usually have kind of where to start and where to begin. Um, the concept is definitely helping, is trying to help in the areas that we have the connection in. Um, but there is a beautiful community of, uh, of Israelis, of Israeli entrepreneurs and Israeli technologists in the Silicon Valley, which are kind of, they are they're getting together and they're in different in different like uh, frameworks um, and they're helping helping each other. Add to that three I would say major many major um, binational industrial research and development foundation which is called Bird, which has been present here for many years and supporting Israeli and American kind of joint projects. Um, and we can talk about this later if you want, which is kind of actually dive a little deeper now because I've never heard of Bird, but it sounds like a great resource. Yeah. If so, Bird Foundation was founded by um, in the in late seventies, together with two other foundations called Bard and BSF. Bird stands for the National Industrial Research and Development Foundation. Bard focuses on agriculture, and BSF focuses on pure science. And these foundations were founded in order to support exchange in different areas, which is industry, agriculture, and science, between Israeli entrepreneurs or scientists and researchers and American. Um, the money originally was um, was granted by both governments, but today, but since then, it's managed by a team of professionals, and. Um, and there are joint calls for proposals a couple of times a year. And, you know, just in California, we had over 200 projects just through BERT. Uh, but when you talk about BART, for example, UC Davis and the Israeli Agriculture Research um, Institute has very strong ties and, uh, and also in, through BSF. Okay, we'll put a reference to to that in the show notes for everyone yeah. to check out. Yeah. And definitely, we can we can make a reference to the bird uh, representative who is present here in California physically. Oh. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What about the opposite direction? What happens if a startup in Silicon Valley wanted to enter the Israel market? So I think I, th I think there is a very um, first of all, in many cases, they can do it through VCs. Um, and of course, there is the presence of a U.S. Um, you know, the trade mission, economic mission in Israel, but the connection, the connections are, um, you know, Israel is uh, American company usually when it looks to move to Israel, it's less than on the startup side, but more on a, when you know, a more like mature company, which is looking into new technologies and new companies in Israel. So the scale here, you know, doesn't really. Israel is not for a scale. Israel is more for innovation. The scale is, you know, the scale is from Israel to here. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was at an event in China and there is a person from Israel there on the panel. And they said one thing that, well, it's funny because, you know, the translation comes 30 seconds later, mm -hmm. but I was cracking up when the guy on the panel said, if you combine Israel and China's population, we're one seventh of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So let's talk about the technology of Israel. You talked about desalinization, water. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. That's really interesting. Desert tech. I've never heard of desert tech. So, as I said earlier, we're talking about the necessities which are pushing us to innovate and to bring solutions. And one of the interesting things that, you know, when Israel was founded in, 40, in late 40s, 48, and through the 50s, there was a huge wave of immigration to Israel from all over the world. And, you know, by then you have, you have very limited resources. So one of the things that we started early on was actually using solar panels. So in Israel, all the houses that were built from the 50s, so probably until the 2000s, which were like four, four stories, five stories uh, high, had solar panels on the rooftop. And we all got to use, we used, we got to use the fact that, you know, if we, we know that we have limited, limited capacity, limited water, hot water, because, of, you know, we don't have sun all the time. So, um, and whether it's the sun, whether it's the water, that kind of created or pushed Israel to look up for solutions to our water scarcity. When Israel was founded, we had, you know, we had one body of water, so two sources, aquifer and one body of water, which up in which is called Kinera, the, the Sea of Galilee. Today, Israel is recycling 90% of its water, has, has built four desalination plants, and basically doesn't have a water scarcity. On the contrary, we have a water abundance, and we supply water to Jordan that doesn't have enough water for its population. So the creation, the, the, the necessity and the need to find a solution to survive, that would push for innovation, whether it's in water and whether it's in, in other industries. How many of these products serve or this innovation there, is it owned by the government, the entrepreneurs? I mean, can it be exported here to the US, to California to save us from our yearly droughts? I think there are many, many, um, you know, I want to be very modest and humble in what we can, um, what we can say, if we can say if that can solve or not. But I think some lessons um, can be taught from Israeli case. Again, we talk about California, which is 19 times larger than Israel. The, the, ge the geography and the demography and things are completely different. Yet certain lessons can be learned. We had in the past Israeli water experts visiting California and kind of meeting with, with, um, with experts here, with government officials. We also had, um, you know, the Bay Area Economic Report talks about the water solution, what can be learned from Israel. And we're hoping that down the road we'll have more exchanges between, you know, California on the government level and Israel on uh, about kind of on the, on the water issue. But that's still still in the works. But um, you know, United States is our first and most important friend, and we're always happy to share our experience here. Not to be political, great, great plug there. Bilateral trade agreements and agreements. How how much does that impact things? And if you want to go to another question, more than happy to. So Israel was the first, actually, country that the United States signed the FTA agreement with in 1985. And of course, you know, given the fact, I mean, it was a huge opportunity for Israel um, when when <clears throat> to export it into the U.S. And um, we definitely, um, you know, U.S. is our you know, number one, number one trading partner. 
um, when, when it comes to countries. Um, and um, the trade, look, it's, it's, it's hard to compare Israel to other big countries like China and Japan and so on. Um, but definitely when it came in the early days, it was very significant, still very significant today, even as, you know, to the extent, no, to, to the extent that it supports uh, the different industries. But, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the trade and the, the open doors and the mechanisms that are existing between the two countries are vital and need to continue. Can you share some stories of companies that you've worked with that you've helped over the years here in Sil Silicon Valley in Israel? Um, lately, I'll share with you a story of a company that lately started to move into California. And that exemplifies the Israeli innovation and kind of a new thinking, which is called a company called Watergen, um, which extracts water. It has a machine that extracts water from air. Okay, okay. And basically, you come with your water cup, a water bottle, and it provides you water. And it doesn't use any kind of, it's not connected to any other water resource. Um, and this company is lately opened an office here, um, even with an interest to make an assembly line. Um, and it's slowly trying to move into kind of to get you know, acquainted and to try and, and, and provide the project. Uh, the product, they have different sizes of machines. Um, and they're here. Yeah. So that's, uh, that we got them, you know, we held them, uh, and connected them to different you know, offices in Sacramento and in, in San Francisco and trying to, to support them because that's not, it's not a classical kind of software startup that is looking for, um, let's say a company to scale and need, they need less our help. But a company like that, or a company like, I don't know, take it, uh, company that these companies which are more, have a more kind of consumer angle mm -hmm. or population angle, um, we, are, we, are, we can help them more. Um, but this, uh, the water gem is definitely uh, you know, it's a unique story of innovation and kind of a solution. I mean, you're not, you don't, you don't need to. You don't need to uh, design it. You don't need to, um, I would say, recycle. You just come, come with your water bottle and, and get water. I'm just thinking how <laughs> that works. Is it like how much energy it takes to create that? Is it, does the air have to be moist or, I mean, well, at the, the air gym, is it everyone's moist. sweat? Or? <laughs> the air has to be moist because you don't need, it's not necessarily uh, about uh, sweating, but it's, um, Energy definitely, it definitely takes more energy than just, you know, just probably take water from the river. But um, again, it's all, it's all, you know, to what extent the size of the, the size of the machine can supply certain amount to certain facility. It has to be taken into consideration, you know, but energy is not, not every you know, energy resource is, is harmful to the environment, so you can definitely find uh, find ways to to solve this aspect. But water, necessity of life, correct. That's amazing. You've also written a report with Sean Randolph, who is a past guest on the show with the Barry Council. Can you talk about that that report a bit? Yeah, it was. Um, the what's called the report that we spoke about Silicon Valley to Silicon Valley, which tells the story, the unique story of Israel and California, um, and I would say the Israeli ecosystem and California ecosystem. Um, it is a unique story because the this connection that we have is is a very unique connection, connection which was not necessarily encouraged and supported by government, but it it started and was created bottom up by people that bring the values and the innovation spirit from Israel and from California. And they're, they're looking for the, next, for the next investment, for the next innovative idea. And where they find it, they find it in Israel. 
Um, and the report for me was it would, together we, I mean, Sean, Sean Rado from the economic, uh, from Bay Area Economic Institute wrote the report and, and I, I had the privilege of working with him and introducing him to many people um, that are interviewed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the report. But for me, it was, you know, an opportunity to tell the story, to bring together all these components. It's, and it's very hard to tell all the stories, but at least some of the stories that reflect how strong is the connection, how strong our, I mean, what is this, what is the strength and, and common between the people here and people in Israel? Um, and to make sure and to talk about the future. I mean, how much we can, what else can we do together? And the report that took about nine months to write the report with all the different introductions and, talk, and conversations, um, the report talks and gives clear recommendations what are the areas that uh, to cooperate, areas to focus in, and water and climate and AI and mobility in cyber are there um, because these are the issues which are important to the humanity issues are important to companies to industries and it's definitely we are the California so the Silicon Valley in California as well as Israel we are leaders in innovation we are leaders in our thinking and the report kind of lays out what's, what's the next stage for us and how we need to continue working together Fantastic. And Shlomi, if there's any other final takeaways you want our audience to get from this interview or ways for them to find out more information, key takeaways, best way to go about finding out more information. So we definitely, the consulate, um, are here to help and to connect. That's our goal and that's our mission. That's our story in so many cases. But um, happy to provide different resources in Israel. Happy to happy to sit down and talk about the Israel story. Um, we have here uh, different different frameworks which are present here in California. We have an economic mission from Ministry Minister of Industry and Trade. We have the California Israel Chamber of Commerce. We have um, the Israeli Connect Icon, which brings Israeli communities together. And you have um, you have other entrepreneurs or other communities which are being built here, which are um, connected to each other. So there are definitely circles and, and communities and frameworks that uh, can be, you know, are a good resource to start. And of course, the Bird Foundation, which I mentioned earlier. Fantastic. And for our audience out there, please check out our past interviews where we also reference Israel and Silicon Valley. Avram Miller, co-founder of Intel Capital, we interviewed him. Uh, James Wolf. There's quite a, a few in the past. And also, any companies from Silicon Valley going to Israel or Israel coming here, if you're looking for a mid market investment banker, that's what I do. I'm not doing this podcast, focus on mergers, acquisition, growth capital, and secondaries. So connect with me through the website, the Silicon Valley podcast, and our social media channels. If you have any questions, please let me know. And with that, Shalomi, I want to thank you for your time today on the Silicon Valley podcast. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for being with you.